In lambs of Jim Charter with them. Okay. But the presentation of my you are the Lambara, Yaja with them. What do you know, lambs of Abo or you can be suing? A long answer. We are the Sakun lambs of Tom Losunik is unink in other Lambara. So thank you very much for the initiative we have got called in so first. I'm really grateful to be one of the uh, participants to hold the first talk on a particular topic on NSO. This today will be the health NSO health issue. I call it NSO health first. Uh, the presentation will be uh, divided in four sections. The first section is going to see us through our way from all over the world to NSO, what I call navigation to NSO. And the second, of the uh, points will be health indicators. Where possible, I will be indicating our situation in SO. And the third point would be healthcare and well being in SO. Finally, there's the fourth point will be con uh, considering pillars of healthcare. And I invite everyone, even if it's very, very um, um, long, to try to stay tuned because. This four point is the one which is really going to give us some aspects of the way forward. The next slide shows us a demographic view of Cameroon and below you have a comparison of Zimbabwe. On the top left, you see Cameroon in 1950 and the graphic is simply a triangle. If you compare it with a country also in Africa, south of the Sahara, Zimbabwe, you will see that we have a similar, uh, similar graphic triangle. So jumping some 50 years to 2000, that is a figure in the middle, we see that Cameroon, though still a triangle, starts taking the shape of almost a bottle, and Zimbabwe is fast taking this shape faster than Cameroon. And for the graphic of 2020, we see that Cameroon no longer resembles a triangle, but it has become a bottle. The most important thing we have to draw out of it is the ages between zero and 34. If you see over the years, the population is mostly made out of people of this age group. All above 30 are just below 40% of the Currently, we say the median age of Cameroonians is 18, and the average life expectancy is 56. The figure 56 years doesn't mean that Cameroonians don't, go, don't uh, get older than 56. Many people still are older than 90, but in an average, we have the age of 56. And everything we will be doing to talk about health and the development of health care system in so we have one endpoint, and this will, be, this, will, this will be how old the people will become in so. Other aspects are important, but are not as important as this aspect. If we compare Cameroon in 2020 with Zimbabwe in 2020, we see that Zimbabwe has first become a box and not more a triangle, like in the 50s together with Cameroon. This shows us that although many countries are called countries south of the Sahara or low and medium income countries, there are differences from country to country. And our question should be, what is the cause of these differences? 
and anyone planning for policy or infrastructure on or human resources in the area of healthcare must consider these graphics we are seeing now. Next, we see a graphic about the population of Cameroon. For those who are not seeing a big picture, we uh, try to describe it in such a way that they understand. And it shows us a range of about ten, uh, five decades, beginning at 1960, because I didn't have any figures be, be, uh, before that. In 1960, the population of Cameroon was about six million. I was born in 1973. By then, we are talking of 7.5 million. And if we go to 2015, we are around 24 million, showing that we have, beginning from 1960 to 2000 or 2015, four times the population we had. We must keep in mind that the area, total surface area of Cameroon remains the same, meaning these 24 million have to share the same space that 6 million shared some 50 years back. Also, the food production has to be produced in this uh, space where 6 million people uh, used to live on. It shows that there is a big competition which keeps growing over the years and decades. When you were born in Cameroon in 1960, your life expectancy was something above 40. Due to the positive developments over the years, we reached 54 in 1990, and due to social, political, and economic problems, also not excluding the issue of HIV and AIDS and its impact on the population, the life expectancy reduced to something uh, around 2003, before it started growing again. And now we are at 56. Are we happy that we are making progress? It's 56 years, that one I would expect to be. In that case, I expect to live five, uh, 10 more years, then I die. So the question we have to answer today is, are we satisfied with uh, 56 years of life and then we die? Or should we do something so that so as a population should grow older to, to at least see the fruits of their labor come. In the next picture you are seeing, it's a graphic showing the population of the world and how old the people became and become in the world at birth. It stretches from 1800 to currently 2015. And what those who are seeing the uh, pictures can see is the fact that until 1900, no matter where you lived in this world, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in the Americas, not many people lived beyond 80, uh, 35 years. They could do what they like, they never lived beyond 35 years. Since 1900, the life expectancy has kept, uh, kept growing. This is due to developments in agriculture, technological development, development of the vaccines and everything concerning healthcare, and also economic development, which has made all the, made all the things possible and feasible. Currently, the average life expectancy in the world is 72 years. We talk of 56 for Cameroon. And with this now, I'm sure all of us will accept the fact that we cannot accept 56, but have to work for a longer life expectancy. On the picture, you see the red lines I included showing where Cameroon is today. Being below 60, we are standing at a point where Europe or the world at average was in 1965. We are in 2020. Should we accept the situation of 1965? My answer is no. So the next question I asked myself was, the population in Cameroon of the 24 million, how is it distributed? 
And this is as a diagram showing region for region, part of the population. And I took out the Northwest, which makes 9% of the entire population of Cameroon. Those who can see, that means for the Northwest province that we have 2.16 million inhabitants. These are figures of 2018. And to me, the red figure is 300,000. That is the figure of those who are in so. I listened keenly to my uh, to Mfomi, who was talking of the population of about about one million. This may include all of so those who are back home, those who are within Cameroon but without the region of Northwest and without the salt land. Those are elsewhere in Africa and in the world at large. If we have to plan for healthcare in so. We don't have to plan for those and so people who are living in Germany or in Europe or in America, but we have to pay a focus on those who are back home. So now I got also figures about the numbers of health institutions in Cameroon, region by region. We see that divided between public, public meaning government hospitals and health centers, and private, private in this sense church-owned and really purely private institutions. The figures are from 2016. What we can see is that the Northwest with approximately 2 million people has got almost the same number of hospitals and institutions like the North, for example. We can use these statistics to compare ourselves with other uh, regions and what is of uh, far more importance to me is not how many of the institutions do we have, but what quality have these institutions got? Comparing, we will see that relatively, we have in the Northwest more private institutions than other regions, relatively, I say. And the question should be, do we need more? Or are the number we have got enough? So now, if we have to plan on healthcare, either staying where we are or developing, the first question should be, where do we have to do our uh, investment so as to get the best results? I may decide to specialize on taking care of pancreas, uh, carcinoma of the pancreas. If I build up a center in Kumbo, I can wait for five years before seeing the first patient. But we have to consider the figures at ground. And I found these statistics comparing Cameroon in 1990 and 2010. I couldn't find any speaking specifically of ZO. So we have to rely on this data to draw some uh, conclusions for our situation in ZO. What we can see is the fact that malaria, HIV and associated diseases, lower respiratory infections, pneumonia, for example, diarrheal diseases, neonatal sepsis, preterm birth complications, meningitis are at the lead. What if we have to consider, compare 2020 and 2010? I will be sure that road accidents and road injuries are at a rise, as the tendency can be seen between 1990 and 2010. So to me, it will make less uh, sense investing in, for example, doing dialysis. Because we see that chronic kidney diseases are at position 23 of 30. Meanwhile, simple diseases like malaria at position one, which can be taken care of squarely and effectively, are not really included in our plan and in our execution of the plan. One fact which is hiding in this data is the fact that of the first nine groups which are really a burden to us, malaria, lower respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, neonatal sepsis, preterm birth con uh, conditions, protein malnutrition, and neonatal encephalopathy. 
is a subgroup of people who are concerned, the women and the newborn. So we have to move forward in the area of health uh, development and health care supply. We must consider the situation of the newborn and the mothers specifically. At the rise also are the so-called non-contagious uh, diseases like uh, diseases of the cardiopulmonal system, meaning of the heart, of the lung, and other diseases like diabetes, which however in these figures are at position 21 or 20 uh, beyond 30, but are at the rise due to our current lifestyles. What you are seeing now is to me the best map of the world. It is taken from the very nice book Factfulness from Hans Rosling, which is, uh, published, has been published in 2018, showing the world as it is. The countries in blue are African countries. Red is Asia. Yellow is Europe and green is the whole of America. The sizes of the, of the balls pertains to this, the population of each country. So with one view, you can compare and contrast between countries. On the left side, what you call the y-axis, you see the life expectancy of each person. And on the so-called x-axis, which is below, you see how much money people earn given in terms of gross demographic uh, product. For Cameroon, lie somewhere between two and four, around, I think 3.2 thousand dollars per year. If we have to, to develop and we are working towards increasing our life expectancy at birth from 56, the next thing should not be going directly to 72, but seeing around us and seeing where can we copy a good example. And to me, Ghana is the next country we can look at and ask ourselves, what makes Ghana so different? Why is Ghana so far ahead? And what can we learn from Ghana? For those who are not seeing the, the, dia, the, the ideas I'm sending, Ghana has got um, a life expectancy of 66 compared to Cameroon 10 years more than we live. And the earnings in Ghana are just $500 more than those of Cameroon. So to me, it would be a question of how can we copy an example of Ghana while we walk towards countries like the Philippines where we have the life expectancy of 72. Now to the main topic of the pillars of healthcare. Healthcare can only exist and survive if we look into different aspects of it. The first of it being infrastructural resources, seconded by management of these resources, education, communication, sustainable financing, and I stress this factor, and our human resources. I have left our policy because policy is a thing we and so people cannot change. We can try to influence it, but we cannot change it. And to me, leadership of tomorrow doesn't mean we are led from above, but we describe, as Vome has been saying, what we think are our, our goals. We set these goals and work for these goals, and the policy is bound to follow us. I will go point by point. The issue of infrastructural resources. Presently, in stock, we have the Banzo Baptist Hospital, we have the St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Chisong. We have the PMI and a network of health centers, medicine stores in villages and towns, medicine men and women in the traditional uh, aspect of it. To me, the future should be modernization of the institutions we already have. And our region so is really ex exceptional and we are blessed with very good and effectively working institutions with whom I all, always have been in contact. We have to reduce the number of institutions and we have to invest in mobility and 
in my opinion, and that is something the first initiative could think of, introduce ambulances and emergency care. In the level of medical stores, we can work for a standardization of medical stores following the list of basic medicines and medications as given by the WHO. And if we have to transport our unsought values to the world, we also have to integrate what we call traditional medicine. And a good example of it is what we call traditional Chinese medicine. It started in China simply as their traditional medicine, but nowhere in the world you will talk of medicine without talking about traditional Chinese medicine. And not all the practices of our traditional medicine, men and women, are bad. Many of them are very, very effective and complementary with what we are doing in our system. So to me, integrating them will be a challenge, but a, a positive contribution to healthcare in so. The fact of communication, we are sitting today and conversing world, the world over. So we have the internet, audiovisual means, hardware, software, know-how, and it is all left to us to make effective use of all these components to make so health first a success. Avenues of digitalization of healthcare between hospitals, between hospitals back home and specialists out of the country, for patient safety, establishment of professional associations where doctors, pharmacists, nurses can meet to discuss issues of health. And moreover, we have to do more networking to work together to strive for the positive future of health first. On education, I was in two sessions, professional and public. We have already infrastructure to train nurses, midwives, laboratory technicians in so. We are on the way to have means of tra training medical doctors also in so, even if it's not a so and so initiative, but the possibility is there. The challenge would be to retain all who have been trained to work in institutions and so, or in collaboration with institutions and so. And we have to repatriate knowledge and experiences back to so. I sitting in Germany, see have a contribution to bring to so health system, even if I'm not present in Cameroon. There should be an interna international exchange so that the best of what we find somewhere else should be carried back home. An aspect I call mentoring should be introduced so that those who are already experienced can help those who are still growing up in their orientation and in their training to become healthcare professionals. And to me, there must be a health education foundation somewhere in SOC to coordinate and cooperate with every institution to make sure that our venue should be a success. On the issue of education, if every SOC indigent has got primary education until class six, they are able to read. And only then can we reach the public effectively in all aspects of healthcare. On the education, we should consider the aspects of health and stress on the fact of on the issue of public health and preventive health care. Healthy living will, will come as a consequence and we can lean on the milestones which have been achieved and build forward a healthy and so which then will be wealthier. Then when the people are healthy, they can work and the working population will become wealthy. What about human resources? The first point I say is return home, return home, if you are a medical professional. I know millions will ask me, why are you sitting in Germany and saying we should return home? I too say to myself, return home. But there are many ways of returning home. We can build ties to give back, even if we are outside. We can support in capacity building of the institutions back home. 
we can initiate and facilitate exchange with institutions back home. And we can do volunteer work, going back home to do consultations, to work in managing and planning the institutions. And no matter where we are, even if we're not professionals, we can do advocacy for healthcare back home in South. Active participation means everyone gives what he can for the good of every one and, uh, for one and every, uh, every other person in the society. The issue of mentoring has been mentioned. So for those who are back home, we have talked of the training facilities of nurses and other medical technical personnel. The next thing should be, how can we keep these people home? Because when I went to Shisong, I noticed that of nine doctors, only one is Anglophone and eight are Francophones. I asked myself, why this? And so people poor, are we not able to bring up doctors who are speaking English, who can communicate with our patients, even in, in, even in Lamso? And one point is, if we are able to make the working environment attractive, making the working uh, personnel see possibilities of promotions, create awards, for example, of the best nurse of the year, making four conferences in so to attract the population, to attract the nurses, to attract the personnel to quali further qualify themselves. This will keep them at the job site. On the other hand, we can talk of attractive salaries to really keep them there, but that is a matter we cannot without further uh, um, science change. We could make uh, campaigns of attracting young people to get interest in healthcare professionals, guide and mentor them to go through the training and to get into the job market. Sustainable financing. Sustainable financing is the central motto of healthcare. Without money, nothing in healthcare would move. And currently, our way of doing things over the decades has been paying out of pocket. What I will facilitate and propagate is the issue of social solidarity based health insurance. For the matter of 100% sure, we have to introduce the idea of state financed healthcare systems, private health insurances, aided healthcare financing. But these last three, are not an alternative from so. So we keep arguing between out-of-pocket payment and solidarity-based health insurance schemes. Comparing the two, one can say out-of-pocket means each man help himself, while for solidarity-based health insurance, we are talking of all for one and one for all. With out-of-pocket, there is no real planning. One is surprised with a healthcare problem, and that's when people start running up and down to see if they can take the person to the hospital if they have enough money. If the money is not enough, many people tend to stay home and only visit the health institutions when it is too late. This leads to unnecessary deaths, which could be prevented if facilities were there for the people to be taken care of. When we have solidarity-based health insur uh, insurance schemes, we spread the financial burden across the, the um, membership and make planning better, make the care for everyone better, and make a stronger system. And we are blessed as so to have two alternatives. The BEFA, the so-called Bamenda Ecclesiastical Bamenda Ecclesiastical Province Health Assistance, and the Kumu Mutual Health, which has been existing since 2003. These two, it is good that we have two of them and not one. It necessitates competition and no monopoly. And where there is competition, the positive aspect of it is a result. Each of the two will strive to be better, thereby giving better services to 
pay, to patients or potential patients or their partner members. And what will make um, solidarity-based health insurance successful? The first thing is the number of members. If we have only 100 members in such a scheme, they are not able to carry the burden of all the 100 members. But with 1 million, or with 300, if we say 300,000, that's the figure we can start to talk of something which is reliable and sustainable. The more members we have, the more we have homogeneity in the membership so that those who are strong, who are working, who never go to the hospital can pay for those who are weak, who are not able to produce. If I am strong today, I can work to support all who need the help. When I go on retirement, I'm not more strong, but the young people can pay in this fund which we initiated and developed to help me then. So it is an issue of not looking out from today or until tomorrow, but looking about our life expectancy of decades. These insur insurance schemes can only help if there is commitment and trust. Effective management is a thing you and I cannot influence. We can appeal to those at the uh, forefront to be effective in the way they manage things and moreover, transparent. There should be an in initiative to collaborate the health care schemes or the health insurance schemes with the health insurance, with the health institutions, excuse me, so that the positive effect can come out of it. We have uh, the saying in so, so if the health insurance schemes are having um, members, they should motivate these members to visit their health institutions when they have any ill health problems. And the health institutions on their way should not just sit and wait until patients come or not. They should look for means of motivating patients who are not yet members to go and register into the health schemes, not only when they are ill, but also when they're healthy. How can we make sustainable, um, no, what do we call, um, how can we make so, uh, solidarity-based health insurance in so, more successful? These are points I think each and everyone can pick to make things go forward. The first thing is to sensitize the population to know that we have these two insurance schemes. We should be role models where possible. Because I think if the Reverend Father or the Bishop or the doctor is, is calling people to go to become members and he himself is not a member, the people won't believe him. So I, sitting in Germany, I'm a member of the BEFA Health Insurance since six years. And I keep being a member. And when I tell my people to join, I am sure they will be seeing sense in what I'm saying. So I invite everyone sitting and listening to join one of these two uh, insurances. Everyone should consider the issue of sponsorship. For me talk about not only helping the family, but looking at those around so that we should not leave anybody behind. So if we are able to raise 16,000 francs to register a poor family in Beam or in Kishon, then we have gone a lot to help these people for the year. And there should be an appeal on all institutions and so churches, mosques, schools, traditional leaders and their families to enroll in health insurance schemes. Smallest, small, big and large firms should propagate the membership and subventioning this uh, membership of their workers so that they be motivated and the number of members in these health, care, uh, health uh, insurances go higher so that they are sustainable. What about making gua for BEFA or for Kumbo Mutual Health? We are fond of making gua for school fees, gua for uniforms, and gua for everything. So why not gua for BEFA and gua for Kumbo Mutual Health? Nowadays, we have not only banks, but cooperative credit unions in almost every village. And there's a means of collaborating with them so that we can save 
so that at the end of the year, it is easy for us to raise the funds to pay our membership, membership dues timely. We could also invite honorary members who just pay or who can give what they have to support the health care schemes or the health insurance schemes so that they can keep doing the good work they have started and continue doing. Also, we can do direct material support of the offices and the institutions. I already mentioned the issue of competition among the insurance schemes. And hospitals themselves could also offer special programs, for example, saying members of BEFA or members of Kumu Mocha Health have a deduction if they come for particular screening examinations. By so doing, I think that uh, solidarity-based health insurance schemes will have a success in so. To conclude, health is a uh, conditio sine qua non for all human well-being and development. And without education, healthcare won't succeed. Sustainable financing is a backbone to the healthcare system. And what I've been talking of is not theoretical, but the theory gives us a foundation for practical execution. We have just seen a shortcut section of so healthcare. And I think we don't have to wait for someone to come and tell us we must do it. And we have bound to do it if we are turned down to do it, we will succeed. Let us not wait. Let us keep going. I know many will ask my, uh, me in, in this situation, you have not mentioned the, uh, the issue of the crisis. Yes. And the second question, how do we talk about developing all these things in the, in the face of this crisis? If we lie and wait until the crisis got to an end and we start from somewhere, we may have to go back starting from where we were in 1960. So there is a chance to put in an effort to withhold the, stand, the standard we have got now and to develop from here to higher heights. I thank you and every, everyone who is not having the chance to talk today can still contact me on the FAMA12 at gmx.de. Thanks for your attention. Come away, Punya, you are.